the rest of, of the attendees will join shortly. But uh, yeah, welcome everyone to uh, to this week's webinar. My name is uh, Shana Rasmin and I'm a Business Development Director here at Impero. I have brought Morton with me today. Morton Christensen is our head of customer success and our expert in the platform. Before we get started, we'll just quickly introduce ourselves and take you through the agenda and uh, then we will take you through our Imperial platform. So, Morten, could you uh, please start introducing yourself? Yeah, I can do that. Uh, my name is Morten Christensen. Um, I've been a part of Imperial for almost uh, six years now. I am heading our customer success, customer support uh, department, meaning that you have the responsibility for all of our clients, all of our partners. So in essence, we know a whole lot uh, about the solution, uh, about Impero, uh, and about the different use cases and how it's being used within uh, different business areas. Um, I'll also be the one guiding you through our webinar setup uh, for today. Brilliant. Thank you, Morten. Thank you, you, Morten. you <laughs> yeah, yeah. No. So, uh, as for myself, I uh, bring a decade of experience from uh, professional services and from the industry as well. And um, I think what was common uh, during my past was whether it was in the capacity of being a financial controller, performing the compliance processes and controls, or whether it was being a consultant designing uh, these control frameworks, or even being an auditor auditing controls, it was always very apparent and clear that something that's really important to make sure that these controls are uh, basically effective uh, and that they're being performed is that they are as ingrained and embedded into the day-to-day -day processes because otherwise people uh, feel like it's an extra burden and that's definitely something that we don't want people to feel. So that's essentially what we're going to talk to you uh, and showcase uh, in Piro, uh today, basically take you through the platform and help you see how you can uh, easily automate your compliance processes and uh, your controls to make sure that it's becoming this ingrained part of your day-to-day -day work. So uh, this webinar today will be a bit more, say, um, a technical uh, character in the sense that we will be showcasing the uh, control management module and we'll be showcasing the reporting module. We'll also be diving uh, a bit into uh, user, uh, user groups, user management, uh, but we will not show you this management module today. So that will, uh, that will have to wait for another time. Um, basically, uh, we will show you how you can set up these the control program, control processes, and how you can automate your uh, processes and controls to make sure that these are being sent out to the employees being responsible for them in a given frequency, and uh, so that they basically can be performed uh, without them having to remember what to do. They're basically just being asked what to do. And likewise, we'll be talking about the reporting module where we can, well, we're going to showcase how you can set up reports that can easily help you monitor that these controls are in fact being, uh, being performed. And we'll also uh, talk a bit about these typical challenges that we see in the company and how we can, um, how we can basically address that with, uh, with Impero. So that would be um, say challenges like people are out of office, they are on a sick leave or they are on holiday, um, or you may even have uh, say bottlenecks with some people having too many controls to do. So what can we do about that? So, uh, so that's basically going to be the agenda for today. You have the opportunity to ask questions throughout the, uh, the webinar. We're going to ask all of the questions that make sense throughout the webinar, but we'll also uh, hold time at the tail end to answer any questions uh, that, uh, that uh, we haven't touched upon throughout the webinar. And then last but not least, we will uh, provide some insights as to our upcoming webinars. So Morden, if, uh, if we start with our control management module, it's important to say what we're going to showcase for you today is from an administrator perspective. So this is showcasing how can you set up your compliance programs 
and that is in any respect, whether that being finance or tax or ESG or IT, HR, etc. Imperial is a flexible and easy to use platform, so you can use it for whatever process. So we'll be showcasing it from an administrative perspective. And Morten, if you can take us through the control management module and, and show us how easy it is to, to set up a new program to automate these controls. Yeah, sure. And uh, thank you for that, uh, Shannon. So essentially what we'll initially talk about here is our uh, control management uh, section. So I'll, I'll enter the, well, the control management here. And what I'll be able to see on, on this list here is essentially all the different control programs that I have access to. And, and as you can see, then they all consist of a sub subset of uh, controls. So for instance, within financial control program, we have 23 controls. We have a few within uh, CIT, a few within uh, TP, and uh, so on. On each of these control programs here, we can control the access rights. So who does actually have access to our um, financial control program? And we have um, three different levels. You can be an administrator or an admin, you can be an editor, uh, or you can have a view access, meaning that, well, you can see how all of these controls are designed, you can see how they are performed, but you can't edit anything and you can't grant others access to uh, to this, uh, this data here. If we enter one of these, and I'll just use the financial control program here as, as an example, we'll be able to see just a quick overview of all the 23 controls that we have populated within this um, financial control program. If we go down just a little bit here, we'll just use a classic bank reconciliation here as an example of, well, how do we actually see uh, a control in Impero? So and in the, uh, control in Impero, it consists of a basic a title and a description. And this is a bit more on a higher level. So in this case here, it's uh, the basic uh, control objective, maybe some background information. Um, we have a link here to, to a SharePoint that could be where you store your process descriptions, uh, guidelines, and et cetera. Uh, so you will always have them handy for the ones who are to actually uh, submit these uh, controls here. Then we work with something that we call tags here, which essentially is uh, little stamps that we actually, or little piece of information that we're actually providing uh, our control with. So we can use it as a reporting dimension or as, as something to filter and, and search upon. So if I'm interested in being able to pull an overview of all of my manual controls or all of my detective controls or even my key controls, then I can actually do that because we've fed the system with the information that, well, this control here, it's manual, it's detective, and we have identified it as a, as a key control. We'll get a whole lot back to, to this, both a bit later here when, when creating this control, but also uh, when we are talking about uh, reporting uh, later during this, uh, this webinar here. It's completely flexible. It can be uh, edited and, and, or designed from uh, depending on what you actually need. So you can have your own uh, tag categories with your own tag. So you can actually be very specific to both your type of business, but also to the type of of company that, that, that you are or the reports that you need to uh, to be able to pull so you can actually uh, well of course have your exact uh, now this is uh, on company numbers but you could actually have your exact names uh, or the exact numbers that, that you're using here and um, so you'll be able to report on these immediately so this is sort of the very basic details that we actually uh, provide the uh, the control with some of these parameters you're probably already um, familiar with. When we have designed that, and now I've just used an example, so we've already done that. Then the next six, uh, section here is our scheduling. So when should we actually do this control here? And per default, we have two different options. So it could be a manual control. That would be a one-time uh, control or an ad hoc control that you're doing where we could go and say, well, we need to perform this action. It's due on the last day of August and we want to uh, send it or make it available uh, 10 days in advance. So that will be uh, maybe 11 days. So that will be uh, tomorrow at um, 
seven o'clock in uh, in the morning. So that's very basic. It's a one-off. It will be sent to whoever we assign here in, in, in the upcoming uh, section. But then nothing would actually happen until we manually go and say, well, the next time uh, is then on this specific date here. There are some um, some controls that, that runs very effectively within uh, within this. It could be like policies that you need to approve on an ad hoc basis or, or something like that. Then you can create them as a manual control. By far the majority of the controls that we have in Imperial, well, they run within some sort of a recurring schedule, whether it's monthly or it's bi-monthly, quarterly, so on. As you can see, we, we cover more or less uh, all, uh, all options that, that you can think of. Now, I'll just do a monthly here as, uh, as an example. And then per default here, we say, well, it's uh, due zero month and one day after the end of the month. And given the fact that we are, as we speak uh, right now, are in August, then, well, one day after the end of August would equal the 1st of September. And then we stamp it with a period and so, say, well, because we are talking about after the end, well, then we are actually uh, talking about the, the previous period, which, will, which in this case here will be August. So even though that this control here would be due in September, for reporting purposes, when we need to pull the dates and say, well, how did this actually look for I need to be able to document my or pull the documentation for my bank reconciliation for August 2021, then we can actually do that no matter when it was actually uh, completed because we have the information that this specific result is actually regarding August 2021. There's a lot of possibility here to uh, to customize. We can, of course, say, well, it's uh, we are working on uh, five, but not only days, as in as in calendar days, but actually five business days uh, after the uh, the end of the month. Then, as you can see here, well, then the next due date will be on the seventh of uh, of September. Uh, it could also be that well, it's actually something that uh, we need to do before the end of the month. And you can see, well, now it's uh, it's something we need to do before uh, August ends. So now we are still talking about the period of August. Um, but the due date itself is now also in August here, as you can see, it equals the, the 25th. Um, or it could also be, well, we need to do something after the beginning. This could be more of a preventive control that, that we need to do five uh, business days after the new month has, has started. So in this case here, again, on the 7th of September, but as you can see, the period the control is regarding is also changing. So now it's actually um, regarding September. There's a lot of information here, and uh, and it can be uh, well. We are fairly simple solution, but but this specific line here can can be a bit a bit complex. Um, what you need to focus on is that well, of course, your next due date matches the uh, the period, and then of course this is something we set up once, and then it it basically works as a template. So every time uh, there's a new month, we will of course just create a a new copy of this based on on the details that we uh, that we provide here Brilliant. So this is when the control needs to be submitted by service there a question Jen? no so basically just to try and, and draw some parallels and some of the yeah. say, challenges that some of our clients are seeing so they're basically saying for example but now it's and this is all good and fine we have now automated our say emails our interaction with the users so they are being reminded that they need to perform this control but we do have holidays so we have summer holidays and we have winter holidays and what we normally see is that the controls are not performed so they have a challenge with, with actually um say adhering to these deadlines during specific times of the year and what they're also saying is that that's all fine, but we do have bottlenecks because what we see is that we have a deadline for control and it's submitted just before the uh, the due date by the performer, but then the reviewer doesn't have enough time to actually review the control. So perhaps you can actually also explain how uh, Impero can accommodate that. Yeah, of course. And there was actually just one quick uh, thing here is that our business day calendar here uh, it's just a standard uh, calendar where that, uh, that that we do. We can adjust it into whatever calendar uh, or business calendar that, that your company has. Uh, so, and if you have um, multiple calendars, so like if if you are well, for the majority of our controls, they run within uh, uh, this uh, calendar that we have, but we also have 
maybe a shared service or a sensor or something like that that runs within a different calendar for a subset of the controls, then you can have a third or a fourth uh, calendar as well um, with the business days and the public holiday that, that they actually uh, actually have. So we can, you can, we can also do that, so it's not something you need to manually adjust uh, from, uh, from month to month. Um, then we work with a notification date, so how many days prior to uh, the due date, or now in this case, how many business days prior to, to the due date do we actually want to notify the user that, that they have a pending action. Um, so this is sort of the very basic, and now that's, as you mentioned, uh, Shannon, then we can actually use this template here to say, well, that's fine for, for, for the majority of the year, but we actually have uh, maybe some month that uh, that works a bit differently, uh, or maybe we have some months where we're actually not doing the control, then we can exclude them from, from the list here. Of course, per default, we're scheduling all months. Uh, but it could also be that we actually need to set some custom due dates. So we still want to have the control in one place. We don't want to uh, create multiple uh, iterations of, of this. Uh, but for the specific period of August, it's now longer, no longer on the fifth business day. It's actually on the seventh. Uh, and then you would also be able to see here that it actually changes to uh, to a new um, due date up here because we actually have a custom due date for the period of uh, August. Then this date here that that we are actually working with here, it's uh, it's when the control has to be both submitted and reviewed or approved by. So per default, we work with one due date. And as you mentioned, Shen, it means that, well, in essence, you could, as a control performer, a few minutes uh, to midnight actually submit your control and then you're all good. Then the uh, review or the approver would have like a minute to actually perform the, uh, the review before it actually uh, turns red or overdue in, in our report. So coming to that, we actually have uh, the possibility of removing this tick mark where we are saying, well, we want to use the same due date for responsible review. And as soon as I do that, uh, then I can say, well, we always want two business days to actually being able to do our review. Uh, what's important to notice here is that the due date up here is still the same. So the due date we are having the setup here on, on the basic details is when does this control uh, has to be both performed and reviewed by. And what we are providing down here is that, well, when is the responsibles or the control performance due date? So now we see here that it's actually on the 3rd of, uh, of September, and then it needs to be reviewed uh, no longer than on the 7th of, uh, of September. So that's, uh, that's possible to, uh, to do uh, so as well and to, to work with, uh, with multiple uh, due days as, uh, as, as well. Um, so in essence, it's now we've, of course, and uh, that's also the purpose of this uh, webinar to, to talk a bit technical, as Shen as also said, but it is actually quite simple to, to get started because for the majority of your controls, it will fit in that it's actually something you're doing a certain amount of business days or regular calendar days after the end of a period, whether it's a month or a quarter. And we work with the due date, we work with uh, when do we want to make this task here available. And then you don't really need to focus that much around the, uh, the, the advanced options. But it's something that will as you grow in, in the use of Impero as you grow in, uh, in how many controls we actually have within the, the solution, uh, and how we actually getting more and more mature in how we use our reports. Well, then we actually want to being able to split between, well, was it actually due on time for the uh, responsible uh, and the, the reviewer? So we can also, uh, also do, do that. Perfect. So now we've defined the frequency by which these, say, activities, control activities, are to be sent out to the performer and the reviewer. How do we set up and make sure that there's clear roles and responsibilities so that people know what they need to do? Yeah, so I'll uh, progress here to, uh, to the next uh, section. There are four uh, sections on, uh, on this page here. So this is number three. Uh, and this is the assignment section. So as you mentioned, now we have covered the basic details. Uh, when are we supposed to do this control? And now we are down to, well, who is actually supposed to do it? We have a few different uh, options here. So let's say that, well, it's me uh, who is supposed to, uh, to do this control here. Then I will just uh, assign myself here as, as responsible. Um, but it could be that, well, Shannon is actually supposed to do 
the exact same uh, control as me, but for a different company or for a different uh, different country. And we can actually do that uh, by doing it like, like this. So what we're actually doing with this setup here is that we are creating uh, two perfectly identical controls, one for Shane and one for, for me, all with all the basic de details, all with all the tagging that we did. It's a key control for Shane, it's a key control for me, uh, it's, a, it's a detective control, it's manual, so on. But we actually use our tags once again, of course, both for reporting purposes, but also for uh, ourselves. It could be that I was actually supposed to do the exact same task twice, but for two different uh, entities. Well, then I could also uh, also do do that. And as mentioned, we use our tags here once again. We say, well, uh, Shannon is supposed to do this for company uh, 100. That might be in uh, Austria, whereas I am supposed to do this for company 300, which is in uh, Denmark. And, and I'm also supposed to do it for company 400, which is also in, uh, let's just say, Denmark here. So this actually means that if I put a report based on country, well, then we would have one here for Shane from, from Austria, and we would have uh, two uh, items for me here for, for Denmark, whereas if we did one based on a, on a on company, well, then we would just see them as one for 100, one for 300, and one for, for 400. So it's very easy to actually put on these uh, different names and assign them that you're supposed to do this for, for this specific um, company here. That being said, we also, um, and now you also originally or initially mentioned uh, the use of user groups. And here we have a user group, and we'll just use it here as labeled finance managers. So it might be, especially within, uh, now it's a finance example here, of course, that well, we know that it's always the finance manager who's supposed to do that. So we just create uh, a finance manager user group, and I'll get a bit back to, uh, to how it's, uh, it's designed later on. Uh, and then, as you can see here, there are nine uh, nine members here, and they are all tagged with a company and a country, uh, de depending, of course, where they are located within this user group. And then I can just reuse this uh, specific user group here on multiple controls, and it would uh, I would then only have to actually maintain uh, the user group because then it will automatically be updated on all of the different controls that's been used different use case for, for user group. As you can see here, we have a toggle option. So do we actually work not as an individual where everyone in, in the user group would have to submit an, an answer, but we're actually working as a group or as a team. So this actually means, and now you can see it shifted from, from nine to four, and this is because there are four unique members in, in this, uh, this user group uh, here. It's, uh, in this case, it's Jacob, it's me, it's Penilla, and it's, it's Thomas. Um, and we will make this control available for everyone. So we will all get a notification that, well, we, we need to, to do this, uh, this action here. But as soon as one of us has submitted the control, it will be removed from everyone's task list. So this is, uh, again, if you have like a finance team or a accounts payable team or something like similar, um, or it works quite well for, for shared services as, as well, but then we can work in user groups, we'll make the task available for, for everyone, but as soon as it's been submitted, then it'll be removed from, from everyone's uh, task list. Then we have an approval flow here, so we can assign a reviewer, it could be me, it uh, could also be that, well, I am only supposed to review uh, Shane, and then Shane here, uh, by clicking assign users here, uh, Shen is actually supposed to review uh, my items here, and then we can, can set it up like, like this. And of course, we can also use user groups uh, here as, as, as well. As you can see, it's optional. So maybe you have some controls where there are four I principle required, and we can, uh, can do like this. Maybe you have other controls where it's not necessary. Well, then we can just use this, uh, this setup here. We can, of course, um, enforce segregation of duties, which means that, well, if I actually, by coincidence or by mistake, actually assign myself to review myself, then we'll get an error when trying to update because I'm not allowed to review my, my, my own work. So this is how we actually uh, assign uh, responsibilities, whether it's to a team, whether it's to multiple people, or whether it's, it's just for, for a single user. 
Brilliant. So we have now showcased how it's easy to define the scheduling, so the frequency of each of these control activities. And we've also showcased how it's possible to basically tag each of these controls to individuals or to groups. We also showed you how you can add some background information to the control or the control objective, etc. But more than how can we make it very simple for the control performers to understand what they need to do so that they're not spending time doing something that they're not supposed to or they may forget something? Yeah, and this is uh, the final part of this section. It's also the, well, I'm not saying the more interesting part, but we typically call it, it's, it's the heart of, of our solution. So this is where we decide, well, what's actually supposed to, uh, to be done. And we see this a little bit as a questionnaire. So we have this gray area here, and then we have all of the answer types, uh, you could say here on, on our right side. So if we want the control performer to be able to write a text or provide a comment, uh, upload something, then we can use these elements here. It works quite simple. We can just drag and drop them in the min or remove them, them again. Um, and here in this example here, we've just used a radio button first here. And each of these elements here, they consist of a title. And this uh, example here, it's, it's quite simple. It's just uh, confirm. And then we actually do some instructions where we have the options to be quite precise of well, what's actually expected uh, from, from you. So we can give some fairly clear in the instructions. Once again here, just to showcase, we can actually do a, a link to, to our SharePoint, but instead of doing it uh, like a long link here, then we can actually use uh, this indexing here and then say, well, we actually just want to have a link where it says process manual, and when you click on this link, it will be redirected to this link here. I'll, I'll show that in, uh, in, in a second as well. Then we have the option here of attaching a file. This is not to be confused by the attach file element here, because this is files that we are actually sending along with the control. So you can see here, it's just a bank reconciliation template. So this is a file that we are sending to the, uh, the control performer as, uh, as well. Then we have the uh, answer options. Uh, so in a radio button, you can answer one option. In this case, it's either confirm or not confirm. Of course, you can edit these any way you'd, you'd like. You could add a third option here if, uh, if, if needed as, as well. We can set it as required. So it's actually not possible for the control performer to submit this control without having answered either confirm or not confirm for this, uh, this specific question here. Now we've already briefly uh, talked a bit about documentation, but maybe we actually need some documentation in return. And this is where we use this attach file element here. It's just been, been dragged in here. And we can say uh, attach documentation. Again, we can be fairly precise. Now there's no instructions here, but we can be fairly precise in what do we actually need. We can even attach an example here of what does good actually actually look like here. Again, we are making it required, so you need to upload something. But we're doing it based on a condition. That means that we will only want to make it possible for the control performer to actually upload something if they, in their confirm button up here, actually answered confirm. And this is a bit back to uh, to to how we. Uh, what we focus on as, as a company, we want to make this as easy as possible, and especially for the ones who are to, to submit these controls here. So we only want to answer, uh, to, sorry, to ask them questions that they actually need to, uh, to provide and, uh, and answer upon. And this means that with this uh, structure here, and I'll just do a very quick um, preview here, then we would have, of course, our basic title, uh, the, uh, the description up here that we did on, on the details. We have the long link uh, here to, to our SharePoint. And then we have all the information here about, uh, about the tags here on, on our right side. We can see when is it actually supposed to be uh, done by. And then we have the final section here, which is essentially what we just discussed here for, for the design. Um, so here, as you can see, I have with just this process manual. Essentially, it's the exact same link as we have up here in, in the description. Of course, the same thing works uh, in, in the description as well. It's just to show you both options. If I say confirm here, well, then I'll be asked to attach a documentation. I can do an optional uh, comment. Whereas if I say not confirm, well, then there's a required field of me needing to do some sort of an, an, an explanation. And this means that it's 
very easy and very simple for the ones who would actually receive uh, these uh, these items here to to actually perform their their control. And I just actually prepared just a quick example here. So this here is a, an example of how it would actually look like. And now we're shifting position a little bit. Uh, I know you also said Jan, that we'll focus on on the admin. But now I'm just a regular control performer. I receive an email um, from uh, from Impero. Now this is from Imperial Webinar. This will of course be from the environment that uh, that that you have. So it will state your uh, company name up here. All I have to do is click on uh, on this link here, and I'll be redirected to the page that we just discussed, just with a few different options. I can say confirm. I can attach something. I can actually even use my snipping tool for this and say, well, this here is actually my uh, documentation. Then I can copy that. And I can just paste that in here, uh, Control V. And there's no limitations on, on the number of files. There's a limitation, I think, on 200 megabyte uh, per file. So that shouldn't be uh, such a big issue. Uh, and then I can rate, well, my control here, I rate that as uh, effective. And then I'll submit. And then that's actually it. So that basically covers all that the control performers need to need to do. And now I'm back in admin mode here. Uh, if if I wasn't already signed in, I'll just um, come to a page that says, well, congratulations for completing the, uh, the control. Brilliant. Thank you, Morten. And uh, I'm now sitting, I'm responsible for this control program. I need to make sure that these controls are performed in a timely manner. How can the report management module help us ensure that? Yeah, so actually, once again, here we have a few different uh, different options here. We'll, for, for the purpose of today here, we'll focus on our status report. So our status report, as it states here, it displays the status of all what we call control results. So essentially, it's all controls that has been made available for the control performer. And now we want to see, well, uh, have they been uh, submitted or are they overdue or not? Um, now I've just uh, pulled a, a report here that already um, created as you can see there are some green there are some red and there is actually two shades of, of green here uh, the reasoning behind here is that well we have sent out 85 controls here for the period of uh, july we have completed uh, 64 of these 18 are overdue and as you can see it's quite a low uh, on time rate and that's because we actually distinguish between whether the control has been uh, completed on time or if it's been completed after the, uh, the due date. So that's actually um, possible to, to see. Now, as you can see on my uh, screen right now, it's split based on country. And we can do this because if you recall, then we had country as a tag. And of course, we have a lot of default uh, parameters that you can report upon. This could be name of the control, what period is it actually regarding, and um, who is actually responsible, uh, who's the reviewer, uh, the status, so on. So we have a lot of uh, default elements that you can pull up here in, uh, in your chart. But we also have all of our tag categories here listed below. So right now I'm just pulling a report uh, where I want to show our countries, but it might as well be now I want to see it um, structured upon company. Well, then I can actually see that overview. It's the exact same data that we're actually looking at. It's just split a bit uh, a bit differently. When we play around here with, with our chart, then we can only do one item at a, at a time. So we only have a look at either country or uh, company and, and so on. But if we scroll down here just a, a little bit, we'll be able to see the table that, that we have uh, here below. And again, it's the exact same data as what we're displaying up, up here. It's just structured, again, a little bit uh, differently. Uh, and on this little setting I can hear, we can actually see, well, what structure do we want? So here in, uh, in my case, I'll actually just remove um, one of them here, but I want it structured per country, then company, then what control or what's the name of the control and who is responsible. So by doing that, then I can say, well, here I have a list of my countries. I can see Denmark here. Uh, we have company 300 and company uh, 400. If I have a look at company 300, I can see, well, we have these controls here that has been sent for, uh, for, for Denmark. And if I again unfold, I can see then, well, who was actually supposed to do it? Uh, there's a lot of me here, but there's also one for, for, for Shani here as, as, as well. 
uh, but I get that overview quite easy. Now, all of these reports here are based on access rights. So if you only have access to a few, uh, as we mentioned in, in the beginning, a few of these uh, control programs, well, then when you pull the report, you'll only be able to uh, see the reports uh, for based on the data that you've actually been granted access to. A really smart thing, or thing that at least makes these uh, ongoing uh, following up uh, a bit easier is that we can actually click on each of these numbers here. So now we have a few overdue items here for uh, for oh, sorry for uh, for Denmark, and I can actually dive all the way into uh, to our activity list here. As you can see, it's these two items here. Both of them are overdue, uh, waiting for Shannon. It might be that well. Shen is actually not supposed to do this task. She might be on uh, on holiday or something else. Then I can mark these. Of course, I can send a manual reminder to her and she'll just receive an, an, an email or I could reassign it to a different user and then we'll reassign only this specific, uh, these specific uh, controls here. Uh, it's not being updated on the, the actual control. We need to do that um, somewhere else, which, uh, which we'll show in, in a second as well. <laughs> Perfect. And um, I just have one question, Morten, from uh, yeah. from one of the attendees, and uh, they're basically asking if it's possible to extract it, to extract any of of uh, this that you have shown so far to Excel. Yeah. So um, actually, and that goes throughout uh, Impero. We actually have a little export icon here that would uh, would export our our report. Uh, so you can export that, and I'll export these uh, controls that, that we're looking at. If I just skip back here to uh, to our dashboard here, I can also export everything that I have access to to, to a flat Excel file, both with tasks and, and risks if, if needed. If it's only one specific program, it could be now I need to export my finance uh, controls, then I can also uh, do that. Uh, I can even go and have a look at what we call the activities list, which is basically all of uh, the answers we have uh, have listed. And again, you can of course also export from from here. And now this went a bit fast, but it's just to to tell you that yes, we can export and we can do that from all parts of uh, of Imperial, and we we export to Excel. Brilliant. Thank you, Morten. So basically. We have showed you how you can easily set up uh, a control, a control program and multiple controls within a program following say these four simple uh, building blocks. And then also how you can actually follow up and monitor that these controls are performed in a timely manner. And that speaks nicely into uh, the next question uh, one of the attendees are asking, and that's around uh, the reporting. Um, and whether you can do something smart about the reporting or whether you have to go into the system every time and uh, and look to get a status. Yeah, so now, of course, again, being an administrator, then I am signed into Impero and I have access to all of these different items here. And when I pull a report, it will be based on all the items that, that I have access to. That works quite well for for the admin users in, uh, in Impero. And I'll just pull out our country report here again. But it could be that you have some stakeholders that needs to get an, uh, an, an overview of uh, how are we actually doing, but they don't necessarily need to uh, know anything about Imperial. They don't need to sign in. They don't need to know which reports to pull and, and so on. So when you design a report here and when you save it, then we can actually do it as I've done here with a dynamic period filter, which means that whenever I pull this report here, I'll do it based on the previous month. So this is why this here automatically shows July data. It's because we are currently in August. Uh, as soon as we enter September and I put this exact same report, then it would show uh, August data. The reason I'm telling you this is that because we have the ability to create what we call a push report. And a push report uh, is to say that it's the ability to make someone subscribe on a report. Uh, so we say, well, we can, of course, uh, label this uh, country report here. And then we can say, well, we want to shen, send this here to, to Shane. We want to send it to uh, myself. We want to do that every month. I could even do a personalized message here if, if I want. And I'll do it uh, every month on the 15th, either day or business day uh, that we are actually uh, creating. So this actually means that 
Well, on the 15th, Shen and I would receive an email, we'd click on a link, and we would actually come to a page that looks a whole lot like this one. Because we don't necessarily actually have access to the data, then we can't dive all the way in and download control documentation and so on. But we do get access to this overview here, so we can see how many controls has been made available, how are we doing, do we have any that's overdue, and if we do, then, then where is it actually, uh, actually located? So it's a very simple, very easy way, uh, quite popular for, for the users of Imperial, to, to actually uh, create awareness to actually, um, yeah, well, make this information available to someone who's not necessarily interested in signing into uh, to Impero. Brilliant. I think there's um, there's time for one more question. Uh, mm -hmm. So a couple of actually touched upon say the same the same subject, and that is about. Uh, user management. Uh, so basically what one of them was saying is that we unfortunately have uh, high employee turnover, so a lot of these tasks are being uh, shifted between uh, members throughout uh, the year. Is there any smart way to uh, to uh, update uh, this control, um, these controls to new assignees? Yeah, <clears throat> and of course you can go and reassign them on the control uh, design as what we've just um, been through previously, but uh, also what's implied in, in his question here is that there might be some users that are actually either they have a ton of controls or they are located in multiple programs and we actually want to re-allocate re, uh, them to, to, uh, to someone else now. You can do uh, this here if you are either an administrator as, uh, as I am, uh, or if you have uh, the user role here of being an user administrator. Then you actually get access to this menu here, not only on yourself now, this is just on me here uh, by, by coincidence, but I could actually do the same thing for Shanna or for someone else within my, my organization. And what I will actually is, is able to see here is that this user is a part of three user groups, he or she is assigned to 17 uh, different controls, have access to five control programs. Currently, there are uh, 11 controls that have been assigned uh, directly, and I also have access to uh, a few different reports here. So if we just, it's, it's basically the same for all of these uh, parameters here, but if we just use direct control assignments here as an example, then I'll be able to see all of the controls that uh, I have actually been assigned to. Uh, and then it might be that, well, all the ones regarding uh, transfer pricing here, now you can see it's uh, it's the same, but one is for company 300, one is for company 400. I'm no longer supposed to do this control here. I can mark, uh, of course, one or multiple. I could just remove myself, so this might be if uh, there's a, a company that's no longer in scope, then you can just remove your assignment like, like this. Uh, or I could replace user and then just say, well, Morton is no longer supposed to do this. Uh, Shen is supposed to do this instead. And then on, on all of these controls here and all of these items, the user has actually now been, been updated. Uh, and Shen will, of course, inherit all the tags uh, that, that was on me as a, as a user. Um, so whether it's two, as in this example, or it's 15, then it's actually done rather quick, rather swiftly um, throughout the, the, all the different elements here. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Morten. That was um, that was what we had time for today in terms of questions. So any of you that haven't had your questions answered, we will make sure to reach out to you uh, directly. But, uh, but yeah, thank you so much for your time today. We hope you found it really insightful. What I was saying in the beginning was that we are not touching upon the risk management module today. Uh, but if you are really keen on understanding how we're basically uh, using the risk management module, then please feel free to join us for our next webinar, which is on the 2nd of September at 9 a.m. And if you have any questions uh, about today's webinar or the use of Imperil, please feel free to reach out to uh, either Morden or myself. So, uh, yeah, thank you so much for today. We hope you enjoyed it.